Hey everybody, Travis here. I'm an audiobook narrator, and in the past I've done some videos on things like my Adobe Audition recording process and uh, performing female voices as a male narrator. But I wanted to do something a little bit different and a little bit deeper this time. Now, um, I want to stress I'm not actually a coach. So think of this as free mentorship if you're uh, new or starting out in audiobook narration or maybe mid-range. Um, this is stuff that I've thought about a lot and I've talked to friends about a lot. And it's something that I don't actually often see discussed in the kind of detail that I want to talk about it here, which is part of the reason I thought about making this video. Um, often when we're talking about audiobook narration, we're doing so in really broad terms about connecting with the text or connecting with the characters individually and making sure that we don't you know, overplay the emotions that are being expressed. There's lots of ways that we kind of broadly try and guide people toward narration success. Um, but I think you can go kind of much farther than that, where you can really tear apart an entire passage into its component parts, look, about, look at what makes them work, look at what the author is trying to accomplish, and then talk about the tools available to you and the many paths that you can travel as you are bringing that specific passage into audio life. Because there are so many ways that you can do it. And I think you can talk about them in a detailed way, and that's kind of what I want to attempt to do, because it's something I don't really see very often, but I think it's incredibly valuable to talk about it in those terms. So that is my aim with this video. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take a very brief passage. It's from a book that a friend narrated, um, and we had talked about it kind of in terms of what you could do within these scenes and, and the kind of options that were available to you. And I thought it was like a really interesting case study and something that was was really ripe for that kind of discussion. So... What we're going to do is talk a little bit about the setup for this scene. We're going to talk about the scene itself, and then we're going to read it a few ways, talking about the specific approaches you can take to reading it, the kind of creative choices you can make, how your voice evokes those choices, the things you do with pace and inflection that cause specific effects in the listener. I mean, I really want to kind of go into the weeds here to a certain extent, Um and let's see if that's useful to you as an audiobook narrator, thinking about those things in those terms. So, here's the preamble for this scene before we get into kind of tearing it down, you know, to the studs. Um, this is a, a lesbian romance. Uh, there are two characters who have kind of been had this uh, romantic tension over the course of the book, and they're all finally having a date. Um, one of them, Ellie, is the more forward of the two. Hunter is the more reserved and nervous. It's kind of our scene. They're sitting down at a restaurant. They're exchanging some initial conversation. This is kind of like, ooh, it's a, a nail-biting moment, you know, as far as romance goes. Or is this going to work out, right? That's kind of your preamble for this scene. And uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to read just a, a paragraph or two in a very neutral way. And then we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to talk about character. We're going to talk about narrative voice. And we're going to talk about some of the options we might have when approaching this scene. Um, and then I want to, and then after we have done that, let's talk a bit about how we absorb and process these decisions and these details and the ways that we disassemble this text so that we as narrators can instinctively act on the thoughts that we have about that text. All right? It sounds like a lot, but it's, we're talking about like a couple paragraphs here. It's really not that much. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this very neutrally to you. Now, I specifically wanted to do this also because this is not something that normally as a male narrator I would generally be cast for. But you can't be afraid about any, any scene, any sequence, any character. You have to be ready and prepared to try and tackle it and do it the justice that it deserves. So there are two female characters in here. There are no guys whatsoever. We're going to rock it. All right. Again, this is going to be the neutral read. This is not how I would read this. Then we're going to talk about ways that you could read it, and we're going to try a few of them, and we're going to see how it goes. Fair? Hunter waited until Ellie was seated before taking a seat herself. She was having a hard time keeping her eyes from roaming over the vision before her. It only served to make her more nervous. Have I told you how beautiful you look? Hunter said shyly. Ellie grinned. A few times, but who's counting? Thank you again. She deliberately allowed her eyes to take a leisurely inspection of her date. The slight blush that graced Hunter's beautiful face was exactly the effect she was going for. You don't look so bad yourself. 
And I'm going to stop there. That's a really neutral read for me. Um, the characters are not particularly evoking a specific emotion. I'm not really, I'm not really pushing a, a sense of, of the action in the scene. And the narrative voice is relatively detached. But let's think about this. All right. First, let's start with the narrative voice as we come in. There's just the narrative voice is leading us into the scene. It's talking about them taking their seats and uh, Hunter having a tough time, not, you know, just looking at Ellie just all over her body and, and, and then ultimately getting very nervous. Um, in most books, the opinion of the narrative voice is there for you to find. It's constantly exerting an opinion. It's expressing an opinion about what is going on in the scene. You have a sense of what the author thinks about this, or if not the author, the, the narrative voice that the author is specifically trying to articulate for the purposes of this book. Um, so, you know, when the author says that someone smiles irritatingly, they're expressing an opinion about their smile. If they say that it's cute, they're expressing an opinion. That, that opinion can inform the way that you read the scene. These are your guideposts. To me, the narrative voice is the soundtrack. It provides those cues that you as a listener, you know, pick up on that heighten what the author is trying to get across. It's like if you watch Star Wars with no music, if you've ever seen that before, it's like, it's so flat, it's so odd. The, the, the emotions that the director wanted me to feel are not being amplified and served to me as part of the narrative construction. So let's talk about this. This is a scene where two women who have just been waiting for them to get together are sitting down in a restaurant together. Now, there's a couple ways that the narrative voice might be um, commenting on that specific setup. And I, I have an idea of what that is because I, I spoke with the, the narrator who was narrating this, so I kind of know some what some of the preamble is. But let's just, for the sake of argument, we'll make a few assumptions. Um, just imagine that the narrative voice is perched in a booth across the restaurant from these two people sitting down. And they have been watching this relationship bud over the course of this book. And they're kind of like, let's take the opinion that they are indulgently amused at how long this has taken. And that this is finally coming. And they're, they're kind of like the big sister. Oh, finally, they're going to get together. This is finally going to happen. And they're kind of like smiling and like, oh, yeah, here it goes. Yep. All right. Thank God you guys finally got together. That's one way that we could approach this, right? The other could be more invested and nervous. We're just, I'm just going to talk about two potential ways that this might happen. Ideally, you will have picked up on the most appropriate to use based on all of the other context clues that the author gave you over the course of the book. But I, what I want to talk about here is the options that are available and that you understand that there are options. So let's say that the other the other opinion we're going to talk about is that they are they're nervous that this might not work out. They too have waited for the duration of this book for these two to get together, and one is nervous and one is forward, and God, is it going to happen? And they're nail biting and they're they're on their side. They want this to happen, and they're worried it might not. Now those are two very di different emotional tones that the narrative voice can have going into this scene, right? So let's try one. First, we're going to start with the kind of like amused big sister. Oh, yeah, finally. Oh, I'm really on your side. And you're just kind of like smiling, like kind of like someone who's been through this before and is just waiting for these two to finally figure it out. At last, they've figured it out. Right. So that's the tone we're going to use coming into this. Hunter waited until Ellie was seated before taking a seat herself. She was having a hard time keeping her eyes from roaming over the vision before her. It only served to make her more nervous. Have I told you how beautiful you look? Hunter said shyly. Ellie grinned. A few times, but who's counting? Thank you again. She deliberately allowed her eyes to take a leisurely inspection of her date. The slight blush that graced Hunter's beautiful face was exactly the effect she was going for. You don't look so bad yourself. All right, so... Let's talk about that delivery. I smiled almost the entire time. I actually had the expression of the person that I imagined in the booth across the restaurant watching this happen. You're just like kind of like a little bit of a twinkle in your eye. Yeah, oh, here we go. Here we go. Especially when she's uh, allowing her eyes to take a leisurely inspection of her date. She deliberately allowed her eyes to take a leisurely inspection of her date. 
she's like, she sees what Ellie is doing in this scene. Ellie is looking Hunter up and down. She knows it's going to get her just a little bit. She knows it's going to amplify her nervousness a little bit, but at the same time, going to let her know that she is open to this, that she wants this to happen. And she's kind of, she's secure in her, uh, in her power and, uh, and in the fact that this is actually probably going to come off. And across the room, we as the narrative voice can see this happening and we understand it's happening. We know what Ellie is doing. So in a lot of ways, this narrative voice is kind of siding with Ellie. This narrative voice understands Ellie the most and is, is leaning a little bit her way. All right, now let's try it the other way. We're in a lot of ways, we're siding a little bit more with Hunter. We're a little bit more invested in what Hunter is feeling in this scene and uh, emotionally how that would play out, right? Hunter is more nervous about this. She, uh, she has, has wanted this for a long time, but she's just not secure. She just doesn't know what's going to happen. So let, let's do this from, the, from that perspective. Hunter waited until Ellie was seated before taking a seat herself. She was having a hard time keeping her eyes from roaming over the vision before her. It only served to make her more nervous. Have I told you how beautiful you look? Hunter said shyly. Ellie grinned. A few times, but who's counting? Thank you again. She deliberately allowed her eyes to take a leisurely inspection of her date. The slight blush that graced Hunter's beautiful face was exactly the effect she was going for. You don't look so bad yourself. All right. So... Let's talk about what's different in these deliveries and why they they engender the effects that they do. Um, I think it's, I don't know if it's common knowledge, but the expressions that you put on your face while you're narrating often come through in the narration. And they often lend you to, uh, they, they lend to you a certain like cadence or pace that you're just more naturally will fall into as a result. So when we're talking from the, the kind of like more Ellie sympathetic point of view, um, where uh, we we're kind of like got that little bit of a twinkle in our eye. There's a little bit more sway to it. It's a little bit more sinuous. It's a li- and and again we have that smile to it. Where so let's let's do it. Let's do it real quick. Let's just compare these. She was having a hard time keeping her eyes from roaming over the vision before her. It's kind of a little more. Is everything is kind of a little together. The 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 uh, the words actually slope together a little bit. It's got the kind of a sinuous nature to it. And again, it's got a little bit of that, that, that raised cheek. And when you smile, you can hear it in the smile. And it sounds friendlier and it sounds warmer, right? Now, if we're doing this in a more hesitant way, she was having a hard time keeping her eyes from roaming over the vision before her. She's like, you can feel there's a little bit more hesitance in between the words. There's almost a little bit of quaver, and it doesn't have that same sinuous quality. Instead, it's a little bit more staccato. We're breaking those phrases up just a little bit. There's almost breath in between them, and that makes that hesitancy come through. You can really feel, um, you can really feel kind of the percussiveness of the way that you speak and how that causes specific emotions to be elicited. Um, this is a tool that you have in your arsenal that you want to bring to bear when it's appropriate. Now, like anything, you don't want to overdo it. But honestly, I think that um, we talk about overdoing things and being really, really good at something is knowing to push as far as humanly possible without going over the cliff into overdoing it. Mastery is that last little bit of the cliff before you go over So you just bear that in mind. You want to constantly be taking stock of how far you're pushing things and make sure that you listen, especially if you're learning. Listen back to what you've done and say, nope, that was a little bit too much. Let's let's pull it back in just a little bit. Eh, It's not giving me the feeling that I want. You need to be able to um, respond to the feelings that your own voice projects when you do this. You need to be able to listen to it with a critical eye and say, or a critical ear, and say, is this accomplishing what I want to accomplish? All right, so let's talk a little bit yeah, now. So, so we talked a little bit about about narrative voice, um, and there there are so many variables here. Um, you, you can read this you can read this line any number of ways. Let, let's do a really antiseptic way. Let's just imagine that this for some reason is a horror. This is a this is a a medical thriller or something, and these two are sitting down. And uh, the upshot is not going to be pleasant later on. And we know this because of all the book ahead of time. 
Hunter waited until Ellie was seated before taking his seat herself. She was having a hard time keeping her eyes from roaming over the vision before her. It only served to make her more nervous. Have I told you how beautiful you look? Hunter said shyly. Ellie grinned. A few times, but who's counting? Thank you again. She deliberately allowed her eyes to take a leisurely inspection of her date. The slight blush that graced Hunter's beautiful face was exactly the effect she was going for. You don't look so bad yourself. All right. This is a, totally a more menacing take on it. It's slyer, it's mean-spirited, and you can feel it, right? There's a little bit of fry that comes off of a phrase. Things tend to have a downward inclination. Hunter waited until Ellie was seated before taking a seat herself. The entire phrase, if you listen to it and you imagine it as a line, starts high. Hunter waited until Ellie was seated before taking a seat herself. You have this downward inclination with very little breathing and not a lot of side to side. This provides a more menacing sort of vibe as you head into it, right? Now, let's talk about, let's talk about that intonation. Let's go back through these three. We've had this menacing that we just did. Now let's talk about the more kind of like twinkle in the eye sinuousness. And I like to imagine audio as a, a wave, you know, your voice goes places, it does stuff, and the terrain it travels is what provides the, the emotional response that, that gives us these cues as humans that we're hardwired to receive. When someone sings a sad song, you know it's sad, right? They understand intuitively the things that they can do with their voice that will make a song sad. Well, you have the same power. In fact, you have greater power because you have so much more latitude to use it, and there's so much subtlety of emotion that can be expressed with very, very, very tight control right? All right, so let's talk a bit about our kind of like twinkle in the eye, we're on Ellie's side approach to this scene. Hunter waited until Ellie was seated before taking a seat herself. Now, did you hear how that happened? Hunter waited until Ellie was seated before taking a seat herself. It's kind of like a little bit up and down. There's a little bit of a playfulness to it as it goes up and down. It doesn't have this relentless downward track. Now, let's talk about the nervous version, right? Hunter waited until Ellie was seated before taking a seat herself. This stays almost on the same line, but it's constantly staccato stuttering with little little pops. It's almost like, imagine someone taking stutter steps. They're taking like little shuffling, hesitant steps forward. Your voice is doing that, right? It's this little dun-dun-dun-dun-dun. Now, as a narrator, you can kind of incorporate the ideas of these pathways, this terrain that your voice travels, to elicit a response, and as you do so, and as you incorporate that into your repertoire, it'll happen automatically as you sense the tone that needs to be elicited in a scene. But to a certain extent, you need to kind of take it apart and understand what those things do so that you can identify them and, and internalize that over a period of time so that it can be expressed when you need it to be expressed. You can do simple things like there's so many things that you can do with your voice to elicit a response. So let's talk about, let's imagine that something is high in the sky. Our characters are looking up high in the sky. Hunter waited until Ellie was seated before taking a seat herself. You can almost imagine the character like looking up while they're saying it. There's, because the voice is just kind of slowly traveling up, right? There's so many things that you can do. When a character comes down the stairs, so-and-so came downstairs. If you say so-and-so came upstairs, they say upstairs, but if you say so-and-so came downstairs, it doesn't sound like they're coming downstairs, right? The, the pathway that your voice travels affects the expectation you have as a listener. You can literally lead people in the wrong direction with the inflection of your voice just by changing the curve of which way you're traveling. It's amazing how much power exists in that terrain that you traverse. So the, the changes in your pitch in combination with the cadence that you use, hesitancy, uh, gliding and bringing all of your uh, words together into a single, single phrase that don't have any breaks for breath or any sort of stops whatsoever, these are very, very different. Bringing your voice and actually having stops that actually happen is very, very different rhythmically than having this more sinuous delivery. And these have very different effects on your listener, right? All right. We talked about that a little bit. Let, let's talk a little bit about our characters. Okay. We have two female characters. 
We have Ellie, who is the kind of the more assertive and self-assured of the two, and Hunter, who is nervous. Now, in my initial read-through, I did, I chose to make Ellie the higher voice, right? Um, and for Hunter to be a lower voice. So Ellie is, a few times, but who's counting? Thank you again. And Hunter was a lower voice. Have I told you how beautiful you look? Part of that is because there's that whisperiness to it, right? It makes it easier to be more hesitant. But let's reverse it, right? Let's have Hunter be... I, I imagined in my head that Hunter was taller, that H Hunter was uh, a larger framed woman and that Ellie was small and compact and daring, right? That was my mental original image. But let's flip it, all right? Okay, so Hunter is going to be small and hesitant and uh, Ellie is going to be larger and still more dominant. To me, as a, as a narrator, it felt more natural to have the smaller, higher-pitched woman be the dominant one, because it felt more interesting to me, and it makes me actually feel for Hunter more, right? Because she has, she's, she's larger, and I, and I feel like, what's the best way of saying this? Um, I feel like it adds to her feeling of hesitancy. Like even her natural size advantage and her height would has not somehow given her the confidence that a lot of people do when they're tall, you know? And, you know, often as a, as a relatively short person, short people are sometimes more hesitant. We're like, ah, oh, we got something to make up for. Anyway, just in my head when I'm mapping these things out. But let's reverse it, okay? So we'll start with Hunter. Have I told you how beautiful you look? Hunter said shyly. Ellie grinned. A few times, but who's counting? Thank you, again. She deliberately allowed her eyes to take a leisurely inspection of her date. The slight blush that graced Hunter's beautiful face was exactly the effect she was going for. You don't look so bad yourself. So, it changes the color of the scene. Um, so, thinking about how your character voices and the choices you make as far as their pitch and their placement affect the feeling of the most prominent scenes they're in is actually kind of a valuable thing to do um, because it really does change the vibe. Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about um, character voice. Let's talk a little bit about articulating a character's voice and the terrain that you can navigate with their voices in the same way that the narrative benefits from these large changes in pitch over the over the course of a passage character voices benefit from this as well and i think as narrators especially when we're trying to partition off a large cast or we have a lot of characters that we need to keep straight in a scene we tend to want to find a pitch that they're at and try and keep them at it. We want to keep this stratification of characters in our mind. And I think, by and large, that hurts us. And we, we generally need to push a little bit beyond that and break out of it, right? So a lot of times, let, let's do an example. Let's do, uh, let's do Hunter saying something shyly. Uh, I, actually, let's do Ellie. Ellie's easier because she's got more terrain going on here. A few times, but who's counting? Thank you again. We kept it up high. She's all kind of on a line there. You can feel it, right? A few times, but who's counting? Thank you again. We're all up here. This is, this is Ellie. This is the Ellie line. Now let's go to Hunter. Have I told you how beautiful you look? Down low. Right? We've got this stratification. But here's what I want to, here's what I want to get across to you. Once you have pinned them to that line, you've established some sort of baseline, break off of it. Your listener will follow you, and it gives you so much more latitude to give life to these characters. So let's do Ellie again where we don't keep her on the line. A few times, but who's counting? Thank you again. She starts up here, but who's counting? Thank you again. And she gets huskier as she goes down. Our voices go all sorts of places. I'm doing it right now. I'm up here, and then I'm down here. I rumble a little bit, and then I'm up here again. It's still my voice. Let your characters have that latitude. Your listeners will follow you. Once you have established the tone and the cadence for that character, and you give them that, that spot on the bar to pin them to, 
you can let them travel. And once you let them travel, they will be able to emote and uh, provide so much more as characters to your listener. Um, all right. So we've talked a little bit about narrative voice. We've talked a little bit about character voice. Um, one of the things I think that's that's important to think about when you're thinking about these kind of things, when you're pulling apart a scene and putting it back together, is this is stuff that often you can't act on right away. I mean, you can. But a lot of what you do as a narrator is intuitive. You're reading along and you're constantly making these millions of micro decisions about what to do. A lot of what these kinds of exercises are good for is mulch. I call it mulching. You're taking these ideas, you're letting them ferment in your mind, and then later on, when the time comes, when the moment strikes, you will have internalized these sorts of thoughts so that you intuitively are making these artistic decisions with these things in mind without having to consciously think about it. You can always go back and consciously tear it apart. But in a lot of ways, you need to subconsciously be making these decisions while you are delivering this text, you know, and actually acting. Um, so it's okay if all of this feels like work while you're pulling it apart and something you could not possibly do on the fly. You might not be able to, but doing the work and thinking about the text and going back over things that you have done and saying, what if I had done this? Let me try it this way. What, does th what response does this elicit in me? Um, is really valuable stuff. And I really want you to think about the pitch of your voice and where it goes and what that causes to happen in the listener. When I draw out a phrase, or when I make a phrase abrupt and hesitant, when I go up and then down, we're presenting an idea and we're resolving an idea. That's what that, that's what that pitch change does, right? If you take it apart, that's what it's doing. I'm presenting an idea and then I'm resolving it for you. That's what that slope does. That's the fundamental response in the listener that it produces. When I take a phrase and I begin to make it a little bit breathy and look up, it implies looking up. When I take a phrase and I make it come down, it often is going to be either menacing or actually imply downward motion. There's so many little key. It's like, it's like a, each of these is a little key that you use to unlock a specific kind of emotional or idea response in your listener. And as you're listening to other audiobook narrators work, and as you're listening to other people talk in your life, you can be looking for these little keys that produce this effect and add them to your library. I mean, this is really, it's kind of amazing actually how this stuff works. Um, let, let's talk about something. Let's talk about something with uh, a, a specific kind of way of doing this. One of the ways that you can trick yourself in some ways, into doing these uh, these vocal changes is by imagining the physical actions that your actors are taking, right? So let's say uh, we've got this scene where uh, Hunter says, have I told you how beautiful you look? And Ellie grins and responds a few times, but who's counting? Thank you again. Now, let's say for the sake of argument that Ellie, she knows that she is causing this response in Hunter, right? She knows that Hunter's looking at her and is nervous, but she's going to look right back at her and look her up and down and make sure that Hunter sees it, to know that she's interested, right? And also to kind of like smilingly acknowledge her current position in this dynamic, right? But let's say that she's also going to reach out when she says thank you again and touch her hand just because she knows that's also going to additionally elicit a response, right? She's going to make skin-on-skin -skin contact. Ellie grinned. A few times, but who's counting? Thank you again. And you literally reach out and do that when you do it. Thank you again. Thank you again. There's a couple ways that you can read it, right? Um, but you could say, thank you again. But if you lean forward and you go, thank you again, you actually lean into your mic, you amplify the presence again a little bit, you get a little bit closer with your vocals, and your listener picks up on it. And... In their mind, this image that's forming of this scene, they can feel them lean forward. Thank you again. As you come forward, you can, this happens. It's magic, right? It's total magic. Um, when, uh, when someone's talking to someone across a table and you lean in and say something conspiratorially, 
let's just say it a little bit conspiratorially. You drop your voice a little bit automatically as you get closer to the mic. You whisper just a little bit. You make that conspiratorial sound. And the listener's going to hear them leaning forward. They, it's happened. The scene exists now. You have provided the vocal change that was required for them to understand that this response is happening right now. It's, just, it's, it's crazy magic. It's wonderful. Um, so the same sort of keys that unlock... Uh, kind of narrative events are part of the repertoire that you can use when you are articulating dialogue. These characters are in a place, looking at each other, performing activities, and the clearer those activities are in your mind as they are saying those words, the more of that will come across. The same way that you can hear a smile when somebody's smiling, or you can hear a menacing frown when somebody's growling, these things will come across. When you look, uh, uh, okay, here, let, let's use another example, right? Someone's coming down the stairs. And someone is sitting at a table waiting for them. John is coming down the stairs and uh, Elle is waiting for him at the table. Well, hello, darling, said John as he came down the stairs. We did two things there. We projected. Well, hello, darling. He's far away and he's up the stairs. We need that projection to understand his position, he said as he came down the stairs. And as he comes down the stairs, we're dropping our pitch as we go as we come down the stairs. In fact, we're bobbing it like we're coming down the stairs as we come down the stairs. Now, you can totally overdo this. As he came down the stairs, and we can make that comical. But like I said earlier, mastery is finding out how far you can go without going over the cliff. So, L responds back. Well, hello, John. And I lift my chin and I project. And as I do it, it has an upward feeling to it. Well, hello, John. Because if I look down, well, hello, John. Doesn't sound the same at all, does it? We understand intuitively as listeners where your voice is being projected relative to the mic and also the physicality of your body. We understand intuitively as humans, we're wired to understand how our bodies produce sound based on how our heads tilt and how our bodies are inclined and whether we're hunched and whether we're thrown back. And these all will inform the way that your dialogue is delivered. So keep that in mind. Again, these are all keys, but you can use physical acting to unlock a lot of them for yourself as you're doing this. We've gotten barely into this. We did like two paragraphs. This is like nothing. Um, but we've talked for, I don't know how many minutes now about how to pull these things apart, and what sort of individual details are available to us, what sort of surface area is available to us to, to pick at as we're thinking about these scenes. Um, I don't want to overplay this. I could talk about this for hours, but here's a couple things I want you to kind of take away from this. There is no just one way to do a scene. There are multiple creative options that are available to you, and the terrain is wide. There's a lot of interpretation that can be done. Sometimes, with some authors more than others, some authors are so specific in the language that you know exactly what they want you to do right then. Some, it's more of a gesture, it's more of a scribble, and you're filling in the lines, but you can still see what they're after. Now, not everything has to be um, emotive. You could have something that was very dry and clinical. You could have a, uh, a medical thriller or a, uh, a horror movie, or a horror book, I'm sorry, from the perspective of the murderer that's very menacing and clinical and there's very little emotion to it but that again is an artistic choice it's just not the baseline right um so takeaways the the narrative voice in a lot of ways almost is a character because in most cases it is expressing an opinion and you can see it in the text itself you can see that opinion expressed if you're watching for it and the word choice that they use you're going to understand that there is an opinion being expressed. There is effectively character to that narrative voice, and that narrative voice is supporting an opinion about the scene that is being described. The author had one when they were writing it, and they are trying to deliver it to the reader slash listener. So be aware of that narrative voice. The narrative is just as much a character as the characters are. And maybe that character sounds like a robot, but that would have been the, art, the, the author's choice, right? It shouldn't be the default. Um, the next is that um, the musicality of your voice elicits emotional responses and you can catalog and understand how your voice does that and you can begin to internalize that so that you can use it when it is required of you while you're narrating. And maybe, that sounds, maybe this sounds obvious, but I think a lot of people don't think about it this way. I think a lot of people think I narrate the narrative and my characters act, but you're acting during the narrative as well. 
You know, you were you were acting out the scene for somebody. You were the musician and musicians. I'm sorry. Musicians are acting. They are producing an emotional response and people that are listening to them. You're the musician right there. OK. Um, the next is that uh, your characters and the physicality that you imagine for those characters when they're in a scene is going to inform that emotional response in the same way that uh, and it's those same keys that you can use to uh, to unlock an emotional response for your listener. Um, they're telling you're telling them about the scene. You're telling them about what these people are feeling. You're giving them so much information so that they are just experiencing what's happening, as opposed to trying to figure it out. In large part, I don't I don't want my listener to be saying, "Well, was that was that good? Was that bad? Am I happy about this? Am I not?" They just are, right? I want to deliver it. We, we want to mainline this stuff right into the vein. Okay. That doesn't mean overact, but it does mean being cognizant on a moment by moment basis of what you are delivering to your listener, right? Um, and uh, anyway, I I think this stuff is fascinating to talk about. It. And I, I again, I could go on for hours about this, but I'm going to sum up. I think it is worth your time to. If you are having issues with this sort of thing, or if this seems like just total news to you, look at the books you're doing and take a passage and tear it down to the studs. Think about the ways that you could come into this. Think about the emotions that the author might be wanting the reader to feel. And then think about the tools available to you that you have to elicit those emotional responses, both in terms of the narrative, you can't neglect the narrative, and in terms of the characters. And uh, see what things, you know, see what things arise, see what's available to you. There's so many ways to play this. There's no specifically right way for any of these. It's, it's, it's going to be your interpretation combined with what the author wrote. It's going to be uniquely you. And there isn't just one way. But there are, um, be cognizant of the other ways. Make a decision about the way that you're going to work. Look at the pathways available to you and pick one based on what you know. And uh, that, that's kind of what I want to get across here. Um, thanks for watching. I'm going to think more about this. I may have more to say later. In the meantime, take care.